Good afternoon. It's about 2.40 in the afternoon here in New York on Friday, the 25th of August. I'm Jeff Christian of CPM Group. I really want to talk about interest rates today and something that I think is important for investors to know. But given the state of play, there's a lot of other issues that I, I want to go over quickly first or as quickly as I can. Uh, with interest rates, I want to talk about a new third era that we're into. And I think that's a very critical issue for all investments uh, because I think there's been a sea change here in the interest rate environment, which is going to be very important uh, for many years to come. Before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about inflation. Inflation is still a problem. Watch food prices. We are seeing very high food prices weather-related losses in crops from California all the way across the United States to Georgia, as well as in other parts of the world, Chile, India, um, and um, other countries uh, are going to keep food prices high and possibly rising. You also have service uh, sector inflation to worry about. Inflation, headline inflation has come down in recent months partly because of a very sharp decline in oil prices, which has led to a sharp decline in gasoline and heating oil, and then natural gas prices have also come off. And that has given an impression on a headline inflation basis that inflation is falling faster. Today, as we speak, uh, the Kansas City Fed is having its Jackson Hole uh, conference Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Jerome Powell is speaking on this afternoon. Our assumption is that he will reiterate what Fed policy has been, and he will reiterate the view that the Fed is still concerned about inflation and is concerned about food inflation and service inflation and, think, and that the headline inflation rates are lower because of energy prices, so they still have to be vigilant. And you might see one or two more increases of 25 basis points in interest rates in the Fed funds rate as they continue to be vigilant about inflation. That's our expectation there. There are other issues at the Fed uh, at the Jackson Hole Conference. The Jackson Hole Conference's theme is um, trying to come to terms with large long-term structural changes in the global economy. And what that means, not just with monetary policy, but fiscal policy, the discord that you're finding between fiscal and monetary policy, and then supply constraints, and also cooling demand from both consumers and businesses. So I think there's a lot at play there. But I do think that inflation's a problem. And I'm going to jump ahead because, you know, I was watching the Republican debate uh, the other night, two nights ago, Wednesday night. It was very offensive because one of the candidates talked about how Biden, like unilaterally, I think all by himself, uh, had caused 16 percent inflation. And um, you can see from this chart that U.S. inflation has never gotten to 16 percent since World War II. This chart goes back to 1947. And we had a couple of spikes up close to 10 percent. 1979, 1980, we got close to 15%. It's like 14.7. Uh, in the most recent uh, bout, we got up to about 85 9% on a headline inflation basis. We've never gone up to 16%. That kind of dishonesty doesn't help. It doesn't help in the broader political structure, and it certainly doesn't help in the precious metals markets. You know, we've gone from hey, the silver squeeze and the price is going to $100 or $700 an ounce in 2021, and it didn't, to the Great Reset and the dollar is going to collapse and silver is going to go to $100 or $750 an ounce in 2022, and none of that happened. And, oh, the BRICS are going to come out with a gold-backed currency uh, this week, and the dollar is going to collapse and gold is going to $20,000 and silver is going to $1,000, and that didn't happen. Dishonesty is one of the biggest problems that we're facing across society. And the feeling that you could say anything and people will believe it. And the reality that you can say anything and people will believe it. Honesty and the ability to discriminate between truth and, and lies are two 
commodities that are in extremely short supply. Okay, inflation. So that's inflation. The dollar has been very strong. And again, hey, the dollar's not collapsing. In fact, it's rising very strong. Why? Well, partly because interest rates are rising and interest rate, higher interest rates are attracting investors into U.S. treasuries and other U.S. securities, uh, debt securities. And the stock market's been rising and private investments uh, opportunities have been rising. And investors around the world need dollars to buy into the U.S. stock market, to buy U.S. treasuries, to buy into private investment deals. So they have been buying dollars so that they can participate in a stronger U.S. economy than the economies that you're seeing elsewhere. And that's why the dollar's been strong. Real GDP, our view has been that we're not looking for a soft landing. We're looking for a delayed landing, a recession, to use the actual term, that may be um, less severe than we have been expecting. We've been saying for some time that we thought there'd be a recession, most likely emerging in 2024 or 2025, and that it could be quite severe. Our expectation is that there could be a recession probably emerging in 2024, 2025, uh, but maybe it's not going to be quite as severe as we have been thinking. We don't subscribe to the concept of a soft landing. We subscribe to the concept that if you're going to see anything, there'll be a delayed recession, uh, arrival of the recession. Put all that together, and over the last several months, you've had the best that we could expect or put it more importantly, this is about as good as it's going to get. Going forward, you're going to have continued inflation. You're going to have continued relatively high interest rates um, that'll be damaging for auto sales and damaging for housing, but not so damaging as the, to hurt other sectors of the economy. And again, you have to look at the housing market and you have to look at the demographics of auto demand a lot of the re weakness that you're seeing in housing and in auto sales aren't because of high interest rates. It's because of structural and demographic changes in those two markets and industries that have been reluctant to respond to the changing demographics and demand trends and, and, and proclivities of their consumers. But this probably is as good as it gets. And from here going forward, Maybe the dollar peaks, maybe it comes off a little bit. It's not going to collapse. The BRICS said that yesterday. They said, yeah, we'd like to see other currencies be more important, but that's going to take many, many, many years to emerge, which is what we've all been saying since the early 1980s. Probably as good as it gets and it gets worse, deteriorates as it goes forward. Politics now come in. And we think that the turn to more negative economic consequences for the nasty, dishonest, self-serving po political situation that you have in the United States and in many other countries, it gets worse starting now, Wednesday, and going forward. We think that's going to have negative economic consequences and negative uh, implications for a stock market and positive implications for gold and silver. The BRICS had their meeting last week or this week. Uh, they didn't really talk about de-dollarization. Putin talked about it at the very end. They said, yeah, we'd like to use more currencies uh, for international trade settlements and capital flow settlements, but that's going to take a long time to come because quite frankly, we don't have the rupees or the yuan or the rand or the rubles or the, uh, any other currency to really pay for a lot of the trade and capital flows that we're seeing. In addition to which, there are all kinds of foreign currency uh, restrictions in each of those countries. They did focus on expanding the membership of the BRICS, which is probably going to have the effect of diluting the influence of India and South, or Brazil and South Africa, and to, so, to a lesser extent, India, in the BRICS group. But that's not so important. Much more important are the discussions going on at the Fed's Jackson Hole uh, conference this week. 
because they're focusing on the structural changes that are really hurt occurring in the global economy and what they mean for monetary policy and fiscal policy. That's all there. In addition to that, we're seeing worsening Chinese economic news. And that's actually good news for the global economy, and it's good news for the dollar, and it's good news for the U.S. economy, because it reduces the Chinese government's ability to maintain or increase its belligerent posture toward Taiwan, the United States, South Korea, Japan, the Philippines, and the world. And there are pressures within the Chinese government to move back toward a more accommodating posture. Unfortunately, the U.S. government continues with a very nasty hostile uh, policies toward China, which is going to limit the Chinese government's ability to really try to work with the rest of the world. You put all that together, and you've got CPM groups existing in recent gold and silver price expectations with some modifications. We have been saying we thought that we'd see lower prices, uh, weaker prices in the summer months, and then stronger prices starting in the last three or four months of this year, and then accelerating in 2024. We still do see that, and we don't see any reason to expect otherwise. I mean, we have different scenarios, but our main scenario remains that these issues, the dollar, inflation, interest rates, real GDP, politics, global and, and domestic politics, and a variety of other factors are all going to come together and cause investors to want to buy more plat uh, gold and silver and drive the price high. Now, I showed you this inflation. I want to show you two charts on the interest rates because we've been talking to our clients about the third interest rate era. And take a look at this chart. This is the Fed funds rate, 1955 to 2009. The average Fed funds rate was 5.6%. That includes this big spike up that we saw in 1979, 1980, into 1983. But that's changed. From November 2008 through 2020 into 2021, we had this long period of zero interest rate policies, where the interest rate averaged 0.55%, less than 1%. So a mass, massive, you had a long period of time where some people will talk about the normative interest rates of averaging 5.6%. Um, I don't know that you could use the term normative properly, but that was the rate prior to 2008. After 2008, everything changed. From 2008 to 2021, interest rates were basically zero. 2021, we start seeing interest rates rise. Between 2021 and 2023, year to date, we've seen them average about 1.8%. And as of the 23rd of August, um, earlier this week, it was 5.3%. We don't think you're going back to that pre-2008 era of interest rates. We think you're going into a third era. Before I go on with that, let me just show you 10-year treasuries. Very similar. 1962 to 2007, the average was 7%, including that spike up in, in 1979 to 1983. From 2009 through 2021, it was 2.5%. 2021 to 2023, it's 2.6%, not much, but it's now 4.1, 4.2%. And those are 10 years. If you want a one-year treasury, you can get 5.3% now. That has caused, you know, this decline in interest rates that we saw were causing people to not want to hold treasuries. When you started to see interest rates rise, there were people who had invested in treasuries and they say, I'm getting 25 basis points here, 55 basis points here. This stinks. I'm going to sell my treasuries. And you saw a trillion dollars of treasuries disgorged. 700 trillion were by U.S. domiciled investors. It wasn't the Chinese government. It wasn't anybody else. It was U.S. investors. 700, 70% of that trillion dollars, $700 billion was in the U.S. market. 
of the remaining $300 billion, maybe as much as half of it was U.S. investors, pension funds, investment funds, corporations, and wealthy individuals who were holding money offshore to have tax-advantaged returns, right? And you hold it in treasuries so you don't have a currency uh, risk there. Your, your offshore holdings are denominated in dollars, and they're backed by the U.S. Treasury. And if the U.S. Treasury ever says, hey, I think we need to raise taxes on the wealthy and corporations, you say, hmm, well, maybe I'll start selling some of my overseas treasuries. And you can blame the Chinese. That's the way things work. But again, I think one of the important things, and going back to the Fed runs rate, because it's more dramatic there, you had this one era, which ended in 2008, 2009, and it was interest rates around 5.6% on average. And the economy worked that way. Then we got into the Great Recession, the global financial crisis, and we went into a zero rate interest rate policy for 13 years. And initially in 2009, 2010, a lot of people, including CPM Group, were saying, well, interest rates are going to have to rise and rise significantly at some point. But around 2011, we start saying, you know what, this era of very low, virtually zero interest rates could last for more than a decade. And it did. And at some point, the Treasury and the Fed even said, hey, this period of low interest rates is going to extend for a lot longer than we thought. They tried to raise interest rates around 2015, 2016. Didn't work out so well. They had to go back down. And now they're raising it. But again, okay, we're 5.3%. Take that 5.3 across, and you can see that those, you know, it's, it's lower than the interest rates for most of the period of time from the 1960s into 2001, 2000, the 2000, 2001 recession. Right? So interest rates have risen sharply, but they're still very low compared to that normative level that you saw prior to 2008. We don't think we're going back to pre-2008 monetary policy. We think we're going into a completely different interest rate environment from what we saw then and from the 2008 to 2021 period. And that's what other mainstream economists think too. That's what the Fed is talking about this week out in Jackson Hole in Wyoming. They're saying, hey, wait a second. We're going into new uncharted territories. This is something that we have, this is someplace we haven't been before. Monetarily, Fiscal policies, we've never had persistent multi-trillion dollar deficits at a $32 trillion debt and a strong dollar because people are willing to finance this. You know, economically, we've never been where we are in terms of a global economy and a domestic economy. This is new territory on the supply and demand in the real economy. And politically, we have been here before, briefly, prior to World War II, with the rise of the American Nazi Party and, and a party that called itself uh, America First and had a slogan called Make America Great Again and wanted to install a fascist government in the 1930s. And they only went into hiding when World War II started. They didn't go away. Racists and bigots and, 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 and fascists don't go away. They go into hiding, and then they come back out. We've never been here before. This is uncharted territory. And that's what the Fed's talking about in Wyoming. That's what I'm talking about today. And that's what you should be thinking about and reading about. And don't read the guys who are going to say, oh, the Great Reset. It's very interesting because... I was watching, you know, everybody was focusing on BRICS. They were completely ignoring the KC Fed meeting, which they used to call, uh, you know, one world governments getting together and plotting out the, the takeover of our freedoms, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They were talking about the BRICS and their gold back currency, which is all nonsense. And it's now in a dustbin along with the Great Reset and the Silver Squeeze and $750 silver. And 
on the internet today, they all have new reasons to say that silver is going to $800 or $700 or $100 or gold's going to $10,000 or $20,000. Ignore those guys. Focus on what's really happening in the world and the fact that we're moving into unchartered territories. Um, the bottom line is about as good as it gets right now. We think it's going to get worse. We're not looking for a catastrophe. We're not looking for a collapse of the dollar or the treasury or anything else. Ignore all that nonsense. It's light. It, this is the ebb and flow of interest rates, and it corresponds with the ebb and flow of economic activity. That's what you have to pay attention to. It, what does it mean for precious metals? It means pretty much that what well, we've been saying. Investors are going to look at the world. They're going to say there's a greater world amount of uncertainty now than there has been since the 1940s, perhaps. I think I should own some more gold and silver and have a larger portion of my wealth in gold and silver. And that's going to keep gold and silver prices high and move them higher over the next couple of years. That's all I've got for now. You go to our website. You read about our work. You can buy our gold, silver, or platinum yearbooks. You can send us a note at info at cpmgroup.com. Next Monday, we are going to be initiating research and consulting services on niobium. It's a little bit of a misnomer because we actually have talked uh, to clients about niobium in the past, uh, but we are now going to start publishing, releasing the first one on Monday, um, biannual reports on niobium. This is the draft of the report that comes out on Monday, uh, and we'll be doing that along with precious metals and general commodities and high purity manganese and molybdenum and tantalum and everything else that we do. Take care. Have a good weekend. Be good to yourself. Be good to those around you and try to do something good for the world. Oh, and don't worry about the 16% inflation because it doesn't really exist. Take care.